As just one example of getting what it pays for, look at the Medicare drug benefit. In 2003, Congress passed a Medicare prescription drug benefit that would partially subsidize prescription drugs for seniors. It contained an extraordinary provision. Medicare, in that bill, was expressly prohibited from using its purchasing power to negotiate prices or to set up formularies of the best drugs. It had to pay, said the bill, whatever the companies or the private middlemen chose to charge. To appreciate how extraordinary that provision was, you should know that Medicare does negotiate doctor's fees and hospital payments. But doing the same with prescription drugs, with drug prices, was ruled off the table. You should also know that other government agencies, such as the Department of Defense and the Veterans Affairs System, do bargain for drug prices and get some of the lowest prices in the country. But Medicare, the biggest purchaser of them all, was forbidden from using its purchasing power. The person most responsible for pushing this peculiar bill through Congress was Representative Billy Towson, chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Shortly after its passage, he retired from Congress, and shortly after that, was rewarded by being named CEO of Pharma, the Pharmaceutical Industries Trade Association, at a salary of $2 million a year. When Barack Obama was running for president, he expressed outrage over this deal and promised to try to overturn the provision that prevented Medicare from negotiating drug prices. But now look what's happened. All talk of overturning that provision has stopped. And recently, it was revealed that the president and his new friend, Billy Towson, had reached a deal of their own. For leaving that provision unchanged and continuing the ban on Americans buying drugs in Canada, the pharmaceutical industry would support, support Obama's health reform proposals. It promised to put $150 million into ads, and it would contribute $80 billion over 10 years to the effort, most of which would be in the form of discounts on brand name drugs in the Medicare program, which to this industry is small change. Several analyses have shown that the innovative research was not done in the companies that sell the drugs, the early discoveries, but in NIH-funded laboratories, mainly in universities and at the NIH itself. The drug companies license many of their drugs from universities are from startup biotech companies. The NIH, uh, publicly funded research, gives rise to the early discoveries, and then at some point in the development process, it's handed off to the drug companies. Uh, they license it in, and they continue the development. They pay for the clinical trials, which they certainly do. Uh, and then they manufacture the drugs and distribute the drugs. So what's wrong with that sequence of events? Well, the problem is that these companies expect to be rewarded as though they were the source of innovation, and they're not. And we get to pay twice. Uh, the, the research is taxpayer finance, the NIH is, is publicly funded, and then we get to pay at the drugstore. We know that the pharmaceutical industry has the largest lobby in Washington. They give generously to political campaigns. So on the left here, we can see that, uh, oh, there it works again, uh, that that's probably a part that comes out of their marketing budget, political contributions, front groups patient advocacy groups, uh, political policy groups. They set up a lot of what, what's called astroturf groups. Uh, these, are, these are groups that are supposed to look like grassroots organizations, but 
they're really front groups for the industry. Uh, they uh, give gifts to institutions and community and cultural organizations. If you look at the donors to Harvard Medical School, for example, and the dean's report of gifts to Harvard Medical School, you find right up in the top few donors some of the major pharmaceutical companies. But that's a lot of money, but it's not $55 billion. Where does the $55 billion go? Well, I think it goes mainly here, into the education of doctors. Drug companies pay for most continuing medical education, which doctors have to get in order to uh, keep their licenses, their state licenses. They pay for most of that. They sponsor most of the big professional societies. They subsidize their meetings. They pay for other medical conferences, educational materials, gifts, meals, junkets. No doctor has to pay for any of his own meals if he doesn't want to. Uh, in fact, everywhere two doctors are gathered together, so too is the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> this is a lot of money. Well, why? Why all this largesse to doctors? It's simple. They write the prescriptions. Prescription drugs require prescriptions. And they do the clinical research. They write the papers and textbooks. They teach the medical students. They provide the continuing medical education. It is important to win the hearts and minds of the physicians. The medical profession has largely abdicated its responsibility to educate its own, to educate doctors about the use of prescription drugs. And they've ab abdicated that responsibility to companies with a clear conflict of interest. In fact, the companies know it's marketing, not education. If you look at those annual reports, they don't have an education budget. It's marketing, and that's what it is. It's self-evidently absurd to look to a company for unbiased, impartial information about a product it sells. And we know that in other walks of our life. Uh, if we want to know whether to buy a Toyota or a Honda, we don't ask the Honda dealer. We know better than that. And yet doctors will pretend uh, that a drug company can provide education about the products it sells. Also, it's useful in this regard to follow the money. If you want education, if you want to take tennis lessons or French lessons, does the teacher pay you? No, you pay the teacher. But here, the drug companies are paying doctors for this ostensible education that they're providing. And that tells you the real nature of the transaction. They are buying access to the medical profession and they are buying their hearts and minds. Now, some doctors believe that drug companies don't influence them, but they do. There's been plenty of research showing that. They influence them not only in terms of uh, clinical practice, but in terms of research and education as well. So this has real consequences.